Okay, let's look at stock indices, and I think we can be rather quick on this one. Um, some examples of uh, stock indices or futures on stock indices, the ES and SPX. The ES is the S&P Mini, which is 50 times the uh, S&P 500 index, and the SPX is the full futures contract at 250 times uh, the underlying. And the underlying is 500 stocks. S&P 500. So the underlying of the 500 stocks weighted by market cap. And it is assumed to have a known yield. Typically what you'd have to do is you'd have to figure out, oh, those 500 stocks, how many are paying dividends? And of the dividends that are being paid, what are the amounts of those dividends over the period of time that we want? And what is the yield? That's a lot of work. So it's usually just uh, uh, estimated at a constant yield that's fairly close from time to time. So because it has a known yield, there's the formula for a futures price based on the spot price, the risk-free rate, the known yield, and the time that the futures contract lasts. So we can simply just use this formula when you get to an index and, and whatever the yield happens to be. There is a problem with index arbitrage. However, it is almost impossible to buy or short the underlying because if you see a mispricing, you have to buy or sell, depending on what you're doing, you'll have to buy or sell the underlying. That's 500 stocks that you have to buy in different proportions, some of them in fractional proportions unless you multiply the least common one to get a whole number and multiply that all the way through. You're talking about some big dollars and some big trades, and you got to be fast. That's 500 that you have to do. So that's really, really program trading. Uh, and who would engage in this kind of thing? A fund uh, that um, probably tracks the index itself. So there might be a fund that's a, that uh, has a, a benchmark as the S&P 500, and they're attempting to beat the S&P 500 by overweighting and underweighting certain components. And when an arbitrage opportunity arises that's greater than their transaction costs, they may have a computer program ready to just execute that quickly so that they can get all those orders in half a second or a second, whatever the case is. Oftentimes, you don't actually have to do all 500 stocks. Oftentimes, you can find a group of 50 or 60 that the correlation between the movements of those 50 or 60 end up being like 99.5 or 99.6.7 percent of the entire S&P index, that they end up being the majority of everything so that if you focus on just that smaller sample in the larger population of 500, you can get close. But this is not somebody sitting on the sidelines saying, I have no position in either one. I see an arbitrage opportunity. Let me step in. This typically means that if you are a seller of, of, of the index itself, a seller of the underlying, you probably already are a holder of the underlying. And if you are a buyer of the underlying to take advantage of arbitrage opportunity, you probably already are in that field to begin with. So you're probably already playing that index to begin with. And index arbitrage really belongs to those big funds and those big firms that are already doing index investing anyway. So the argument, the arbitrage argument would still hold, although again, it's not going to be everyone that can take advantage of this, but that's not necessary. All we need is, is a number of large players that will step in and do this and yes, there are some that will step in and do this. There are those that do do it. So because we know that they are out there doing it, the arbitrage argument still holds so we can accept this uh, as it stands. So let's, uh, let's just do a, a little example here. And we'll put our timeline out. And let's say that we observe the spot price on the index at inception, at contract inception is 1300 and there's a certain amount of time that we want to cover, and that time is three months. We're looking at a futures price today for a three-month delivery in the future. Uh, we know that the um, return on the index is 1% per annum. And typically, we would convert this into continuous compounding. Uh, because it's an index, we're going to assume that it's 1% per quarter. 
or sorry, 1% per annum with 0.25 per quarter. In other words, M equal to 4, but we'll just skip that for now. You would, you would convert that to a continuous compounding, but we're really just trying to show how this all comes together. And the risk-free rate of 5%. So basically, you would just... Uh, um, just uh, substitute it in. We have 1300 uh, on the index today. E to the 0 0.05 minus 0 0.01 uh, and of course it's for three months and you'll get 13, 1307. This number by the way is referred to as fair value. So if you ever hear uh, 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 if you're watching CNBC or Bloomberg and you hear that the futures are trading uh, at 10 points above fair value or 10 points below fair value, you know what fair value is. Fair value is what the index should be trading at for the next expiration date. That's for the next expiration date. So whatever, uh, whatever period of time this is, when we refer to the fair value of the index, we're talking about T being the very next uh, a futures contract in the series that expires. So whatever the next, the front line contract is, we refer to that as as, uh, as fair value. So again, I said, uh, I, I made a note earlier uh, about talking about index arbitrage. What if the futures price does not equal S naught E to the R minus Q T? Um, what if it doesn't equal? Is arbitrage still possible? And yes, it is for two reasons. Number one is there are uh, uh, index funds out there stand, that stand ready to do it. And number two, you don't really have to do the 500 stocks to get a correlation that's almost 100%. You can get well into the 99% range by grabbing a basket of 50 or 60 uh, of the more liquid, uh, bigger stocks that have the most volume. Uh, and and they'll get you as close to uh, as close to the real thing as as uh, as you'll get. All right, let's move on to currencies. Let's talk about currencies now. And currencies can be tricky uh, because we're dealing with two things at this point. We're dealing with uh, a foreign currency, and we're dealing with a U.S. currency. So we have to convert from one currency to another. We haven't had to do that yet. Everything we've done has been priced in in a constant currency. Now we're dealing with currencies and currencies are traded in pairs. So we need our terminology to be very specific here. And our terminology for S0 is the spot price of one unit of the foreign currency in US dollars. In other words, S0 will be quoted in US dollars. So whatever price we get, that is the value of one of the foreign currency in U.S. dollars. And F0 will also be quoted in U.S. dollars. So here is CAD. This is the, the ticker for the futures uh, contract on the Canadian dollar. CAD for December 15th is 0.7665. Since that's the futures contract, that's the futures price, that's F0. Notice that it is quoted in U.S. dollars. It is saying that one unit of the foreign currency, Canadian, is equal to 0.7665 F0. Well, actually, this is the futures price. That's not the spot price, but the spot price and the futures price are both quoted in US dollars. So one Canadian dollar equals 0.7665 USD. That would be the delivery price. If we want to know what the spot looks like. Spots are quoted in pairs. So the most, uh, the common uh, terminology for the US, uh, uh, for this pair is USD. Dot CAD. Now, the order of the pair matters. The order matters. What this is saying is that one US dollar buys how much of the CAD? So when we look in the spot market for US.CAD, we find at the time that, that the futures price was at this point, we find 1.30403. Well, this is the wrong way. This, this doesn't help us at all. Because what this is saying is that one US dollar is one a dollar thirty point four zero three Canadian? That doesn't help us. We need the spot price in terms of one unit of the foreign currency in U.S. dollars. So we need. We don't want the U.S. dot CAD. We need the CAD dot USD. Remember, the first of the pair is always the one. So whenever you're looking at uh, uh, forex pairs, uh, the first unit you can always say one of the first unit buys this much of this currency. So the one unit 
of this of the US buys the quoted price of this currency. That's how we read it. So we need it to be CAD.USD. And the way we get CAD.USD is equal to 1 over 1.30403, which would be 0 0.7668. Look at the futures price, 0.7665. Notice how close they are. So now we need our spot price in terms of CAD.US. Once we have that, we need our futures price will also be in the same currency. That's an important point because there are some currencies that are quoted, that, uh, quoted as the U.S. is the first of the pair, and there are some that are quoted where U.S. is the second of the pair. For instance, the euro is quoted euro.usd. So there's no need to change whatever spot price we find for euro.usd. There's no need to change that. And that's about 1.1350. So what this reads is that 1 euro buys 1.1350 of the U.S. Since that's already in U.S. dollars, we don't have to change it. But for the Canadian, it's USD.CAD, which means that we have to flip it around and invert, invert it to get the spot price that we want. Typically on any trading platform in your little box where uh, you're quoted your price, there'll be a, a little arrow that looks like this. If you click on that, it clicks the pairs around so that you can actually see it. I'm going too far afield, but there we go. So what we're looking for, if you find a spot rate as xxx.usd, that's in the it's it's in the right uh, format. What we don't want is usd.xxx. If we have this, you have to invert the price to get uh, what we want. So. How do we uh, how do we calculate uh, F naught on a futures contract? We need to know uh, on currencies. Well, how will we think about it? Any currency trader knows that at five o'clock every day you have to pay the roll. What is the roll? Well, when you look at the pair that we have here, U.S. CAD. Uh, there's two there's two currencies here: the U.S. dollar and the Canadian dollar. So let's say that I buy the pair. When I buy the pair, I'm betting that this goes up, which means that I am betting that the U.S. dollar strengthens against the Canadian dollar because I'm betting the U.S. dollar buys even more. One U.S. dollar buys even more of a Canadian dollar. So when I'm long, I'm long the U.S., I'm short the Canadian. If I short the pair, that means I'm long the Canadian and short the US because one US dollar will buy less and less and less of the CAD. So the US, I could say the US is weakening against the Canadian or the Canadian is strengthening. But here's the thing. Every currency has an interest rate associated with it. Every currency. So if I'm long the Canadian, sorry, long the US and short the Canadian, I will make interest on my US dollars, but I will have to pay interest on the Canadian dollars which means that spread, the difference between the interest I can earn and the interest I pay, if the U.S. is paying 2% and the Canadian is paying 1%, my roll will be positive, which means every day I'll make some interest. I'll make net interest on that trade. But if I'm long a low-yielding currency and I'm short a high-yielding currency, I will have to pay interest every single day on my, on my spot trade, not on the futures. That doesn't work. This is just on the spot. So because of that, we can conceive of every currency as having a known yield. So here we are. R, we know, is the U.S. risk-free rate. RF is the foreign risk-free rate. So if we can conceive of every currency as having a known yield, that is just E to the R minus QT. But let's use the proper notation. I'm just saying that, uh, remember, the known yield is Q. We would actually write it as S naught E to the R minus the RF T, where Q is analogous to RF. So it would be the domestic uh, rate or the rate on the currency that we're long minus the rate on the currency that we're short. And because we're dealing with the futures, U.S. futures, it will always be in U.S. dollars. R will always be the U.S. risk-free rate. If the U.S. rate is higher than the foreign rate, as we head out in, in, in the maturity, uh, three months, six months, 
nine months. As we head out on the uh, uh, looking at calculate the futures price three months out, six months out, nine months out, we should get uh, an upward sloping uh, line because this would tell us that the U.S. currency uh, pays a higher interest rate than the foreign currency. However, if the foreign currency has a higher interest rate than the current currency, we would get a downward sloping futures curve the further out uh, that we go. So keep that in mind. That's something uh, uh, particular to currencies. You have to make sure that you're looking at your currency in the right format, something, something, something dot USD. If you're looking at that spot price, you're right. As long as USD is in second place, you'll have the spot. Typically, the XXX will have, it'll be the same uh, 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 ticker for the uh, futures price. So US.CAD, I can flip it around to CAD.US. I can type in CAD in my trading platform to search under futures, and I'll get all the Canadian, uh, uh, all the US-based CAD futures contracts uh, by month listed out. There we go. Let's move on.